Despite most of the focus on legendary figures throughout the Wild West centering on pioneers, outlaws, and military figures, there are countless other incredible peoples from the Western frontier, specifically of Native American communities. Some of these indigenous icons are well known across America. These stories range from the legends of female figures, such as Pocahontas and Sacagawea, to the detailed records of military masterminds, such as Red Cloud and Geronimo, to the strongest of the resistors, such as Tecumseh and Sitting Bull. Regardless of their profession or wartime feats, there are plenty of other impressive indigenous folks whose stories have yet to be told on a wide basis. Specifically, the warriors who helped fight for their people's land rights and other affairs are often footnotes in the texts written about only a select few. To shine the light on other fearless figures and fascinating subjects to come from Native American backgrounds during the time of westward expansion, here are two legendary indigenous warriors of the Wild West. Roman Nose was born circa 1823 to the Northern Sutai Band of Northern Cheyenne Native Americans. As a child, he was most often referred to by his nickname, Bat, but eventually grew to be a warrior in training and was awarded a more noble name, this one Okene, redubbed to Roman Nose by the white settlers in the latter half of the 19th century. Growing up during the height of the fur trade, Roman Nose was brought up in a military-centric tribe, who were slowly growing forces as the tides of settler-indigenous relations turned towards the worst. Roman Nose entered adulthood with a deep-rooted sympathy for his fellow Cheyenne tribesmen, many of whom disapproved of the land being taken from them despite the various signed treaties. It didn't take long for Roman Nose to apply his teachings on the battlefield and prove to the war chiefs around him that he was beset with the skills necessary to lead fellow warriors into battle. Roman Nose had been questioned over his desire for chieftaincy at a young age as well, but told the tribal leadership his efforts were of better use on the battlefield and not in councils. His superiors agreed with him, and before long, Roman Nose was a stalwart in military offenses around the Great Plains. One of Roman Nose's greatest attributes was his leadership skills, namely, his influence on fellow warrior bands. It was said that others both on his side and posing as his foe could feel the bravery emanating from him. He looked the part of the war chief too. Roman Nose would always take commanding position on the battlefield, ready to implement savvy tactics admired by all. For instance, he'd take charge on a line of army troops, only to run parallel just within rifle range eliminating precious ammunition stock for the U.S. troops and forcing them to waste both time and resources. Roman Nose was so predominantly feared and heralded by the United States military and local settlers at one point, they believed he was the chief of the entirety of Cheyenne Nation itself. Roman Nose took the admonishment in stride, embracing his role as a vital warrior for the Cheyenne people. He directly opposed the idea of white advancement westward and into the Great Plains, and swore his life to do whatever necessary to fight the migration. In fact, Roman Nose was so adamantly against advancement and industrialization of the pioneers, it was said that ever surrendering or giving in to the United States was never even an option for the Cheyenne warrior. To prepare for life on the battlefield, Roman Nose dedicated much of his spare time to medicine and spiritual rituals. Every day consisted of consecutive hours working on ways to strengthen his mind and spirit. There were various times Roman Nose would be the last one to arrive on the battlefield, as he spent more time in prayer, requesting blessings for the impending conflict, than any other warrior. Between battles and acts of warfare, Roman Nose would retreat from his camp to engage in days-long vision quests, in attempts to amplify his strengths and cleanse his spirit of real-world trials. These practices supplied Roman Nose with boundless courage, as did his legendary war bonnet famously associated with the Cheyenne warrior. The war bonnet was also said to have been filled with spiritual powers, such as protection during wartime. It was given to Roman Nose by a medicine man, formerly known as Ice. 
Ice had constructed the war bonnet himself, and specifically told Roman Nose himself that as long as he followed a strict set of guidelines, the war bonnet would never allow the bullet of a white man to strike him dead. The guidelines were as follows. Red Cloud could not shake the hand of a white man, and he couldn't eat any food touched by an iron object. If the guidelines were disobeyed, Roman Nose was told he'd certainly be killed on the battlefield. Some legends have it that the breaking of the guidelines is what ultimately sealed Roman Nose's fate. However, eight years before that, Roman Nose started his near-decade run of spirited warrior efforts of any Cheyenne or Great Plain Native American. These years began on the Oregon Trail, where it crossed through Cheyenne lands. One major event saw Roman Nose raid a wagon train of migrating Mormons, on their way to Salt Lake City. While the cattle was defended in the middle of the wagon circle, the sparse Mormon men on the outside were no match for Roman Nose's tactics, as he blazed around the wagon trains in countless circles, the Mormons taken down in succession. Some of Roman Nose's other legendary accomplishments happened off the battlefield, but rather in other walks of life. One such miraculous feat came on a bison hunt with his brother-in-law. The two warriors decided to hunt, abiding by the rules of a one-arrow-to-kill hunt, where each man got one shot to take down an entire bison. As Roman Nose was aimed to kill the bison in front of him, his brother-in-law pulled too hard on his bowstring he equipped, and the arrow jerked high into the air. Thinking quickly, Roman Nose shot his arrow at his own bison before riding his stallion at full speed, catching the rogue arrow from midair with his bare hand and thrusting it into his bowstring killing a second bison all in a single motion. His brother-in-law never could pay enough thanks for Roman Nose saving his reputation back at the camp. Roman Nose was also known to help out his closest friends and allies in social settings. In one charming story, he was talking to a dear friend from a band of Sioux. The Sioux friend was telling Roman Nose of a girl he was attracted to in his local Cheyenne tribe despite his many failed attempts to court the girl officially. Roman Nose told his friend he'd help him out, and later approached the Cheyenne girl in question. He asked the girl to return the following night, the time of day when relationships were kindled in Plains tribes, to elope and spend a honeymoon amongst his friends of the Sioux. Of course, the following night came around, and the Cheyenne girl found Roman Nose's Sioux friend, instead of the Cheyenne warrior himself. She didn't realize her mistake until the next day, however, and ended up living a happy life with a man who now owned his personal and family well-being to Roman Nose. Back on the battlefield, the great Cheyenne warrior was adding to his list of adventures fighting the advancement of white settlers. After the horrifying Sand Creek Massacre in eastern Colorado in 1864, Roman Nose led offenses on various Euro-American locales such as the Battle of Julesburg in 1865, followed by minor conflicts in southern Wyoming and along the Platte Valley in Kansas and Nebraska. Later that year, after the passage of the Little Arkansas Treaty, of which Roman Nose opposed, he teamed up with various military bands of the Cheyenne tribe, including the revolutionary dog soldiers of the Cheyenne fame. These offenses ranged from protecting the sacred hunting grounds near the Smoky Hill River as well as other ancestral lands sitting in the Republican Valley. Roman Nose, ultimately, would meet his fate on the place he truly is most remembered for, the final battle and sworn protection of the Cheyenne's land rights, called the Battle at Beecher Island. In the days leading up to the conflict, Roman Nose was visiting one of his friendly Sioux camps to participate in a great feast happening within the tribe. One of the dishes served at the feast, reportedly fry bread, was touched by an iron fork when removed from the frying pan. Of course, Roman Nose was ignorant to this at the time, and was one of many who ate the fry bread. It was only in the hours leading up to the second onset against Beecher Island that Roman Nose was informed of this mistake by a fellow warrior. Roman Nose was paralyzed for maybe the first time in his life. His war bonnet would surely lose its protective powers as one of the guidelines was violated. Knowing it would be his final battle, Roman Nose held back, contemplating a medicine ritual to help restore the powers to the bonnet and cleanse his soul of wrongdoing. 
However, this moment never came, as an older female Cheyenne, by the name of White Contrary, approached Roman Nose and bickered at him for not joining his fellow warriors at Beecher Island. Roman Nose, encouraged by the Elder, decided to sacrifice his life for one final offense with his tribe, knowing death was certain. Other accounts don't contribute Roman Nose's death to the magical powers, or in this case lack thereof, in the war bonnet. These reports state Roman Nose died as a result of a strategic mistake and manpower of the US forces, led by noted leader General Forsyth. Roman Nose had apparently commanded his warriors to charge the islands without hesitation, and that the first warrior to reach the island would be bequeathed with a war bonnet themselves. However, the objective was too difficult to obtain, and many warriors lost their lives in the rushed onset. Unwilling to let his warriors die in vain, Roman Nose led a second charge himself, attempting to take advantage of the soldiers as General Forsyth had fallen maimed and was unable to lead the faction. However, despite making strong headway on the islands and claiming multiple casualties along the way, Roman Nose was shot from short range, succumbing to his wounds and dying late in the afternoon, just as the sun was setting over the horizon. The legacy of Roman Nose is a contested topic for many, as he dealt great damage to the US forces. However, he is mostly remembered as a courageous and incomparable warrior, whose spirit and soul for the Cheyenne has influenced many of his descendants and the folks who admire his bravery in defending the land. The story of Kinpoash, colloquially known as Captain Jack, takes us back to the first half of the 19th century, on the ancestral territory of the Modoc people, located near Tule Lake on the present-day border of California and Oregon. Much of Kinpoash's early life is generally unspecified. He was known to be closely connected with his fellow Modoc tribesmen, who had been living in the 5,000-acre swath of land off the Pacific coast for centuries. Their peace was not infinite, however, when the colonization of America struck the Pacific Northwest and displaced many people of indigenous backgrounds. Included in these displacements was the Modoc, and specifically, Kimpuash and his family. In 1864, large numbers of European settlers had moved into the area and began to apply pressure to the Modoc people. They were eager to use the fertile lands surrounding Tule Lake for their own benefit ignoring the sovereignty that had existed in the territory for generations. The Modoc people tried to resist, and they weren't alone. Some of the sparse settlers who had already moved into the region and were living peacefully with the Modoc shared the sentiments with their indigenous neighbors. The harmony needed not to be disturbed. Of course, with the involvement of the United States federal government and infusion of military forces in the region, these pleas were swiftly denied. As a result, Kinpoash and the rest of his clan were removed from their ancestral territory and displaced in the Klamath Reservation, a US-mandated tribal land situated in the southwest region of Oregon. The removal efforts were quickly realized to be intolerable for everyone involved on the side of the Modoc tribe. The Klamath Reservation, and more specifically the Klamath people, were longtime rivals of the Modoc near Tule Lake and consisted of larger populations. The Modoc people felt cramped and unwelcomed. Being on Klamath land meant intra-tribal conflicts and the mistreatment of certain folks at the hands of the Klamath. It was their land after all, and the growing feeling amongst the Modoc was anger. They were dissatisfied and unwilling to sit back and allow their people to live through their discomfort, Kinpuash chief among them. By 1865, Kinpuash had made his mark both on the Modoc tribe but also on the settlers and the US officials who were directly opposed to his leadership. They nicknamed the warrior Captain Jack, but more as an insult than as an alias. Kinpuash didn't bat an eye, however, and defied the United States' unjust mandate that same year, guiding a small band south across the border and back to their ancestral grounds along the California border. The reunitement didn't last forever, though. In 1869, U.S. Army officials were directed to force the Modoc Band back north and settle on the Klamath Reservation. Disobedience wasn't an option this time around either. Kimpuash was unfazed yet again, 
he returned to Southwest Oregon only to learn the livelihood of the Modoc people who stuck around had remained the same. His families and allies were unhappy and unwelcomed. There was no way to press on living. In the second act of defiance, Kinpawash gathered hundreds of fellow Modoc tribesmen to return to the Tule Lake region and California once more, this time without plans to come back. In April of 1870, the Modocs set out for the final time to reclaim their ancestral territory. Over the course of the next couple years, Kinpawash and the rest of his tribe were introduced to an additional influx of white settlers who had moved to the Tule Lake area. These specific settlers were unhappy with the return of the Modoc and started writing to the U.S. government regarding their complaints. The United States was quick to react, having spent the better part of eight years forcing the Modoc to stick to the Klamath Reservation. To kickstart the next removal process, the federal government tapped T.B. O'Neill, Bureau of Indian Affairs Superintendent, to contact the commanding officer at Fort Klamath and gather enough troops to persuade Kintpuash and his band to leave. By November 29, 1872, the U.S. troops were in contact with Kintpuash and his campsite located on the Lost River, in a region known as Emigrant Crossing. The Army faction, led by Captain James Jackson, first requested Kintpuash to leave, along with the rest of the Modoc tribe, without violence. Kinpuash could sense the strength this new outfit of soldiers brought with them, and agreed to return to the Klamath Reservation. The situation didn't resolve there, however. Even after agreeing to leave the border, Kinpuash and his band of warriors were asked to disarm by Captain Jackson. This was the first time the Modoc subchief had ever been requested to do such a thing, but slowly abided as did the rest of his band behind him. It wasn't until a verbal confrontation broke out between another Modoc warrior named Scarface Charlie and another army sergeant that the real violence started. When the two adversaries couldn't de-escalate the argument, they pulled out their revolvers and fired one round each, both men missing their target. It was enough of a conflict to encourage the rest of the men to pick their weapons back up and crossfire with the U.S. forces. After a few minutes of battle, Kinpuash convinced his men to fall back and abandon their Lost River camp, while Captain Jackson barked orders for his soldiers to fall back in line and await reinforcements before the next incident. After the Battle of Lost River, Kinpuash brought the remaining Modoc members to the lava beds in Northern California to officially set up their defense. The lava beds were the perfect military battleground, as the natural trench system allowed for defensive positioning, while the various caves allowed for protection over the non-combative women and children. It took a couple of months for a reinforced U.S. Army to locate Kinpuash and his people, and they were finally detected on January 17, 1873, when an official attack was launched by General Edward Canby. Thirty-five of his men died in the conflict, while the Modoc held zero casualties. With the Modoc War in full swing, Kinpuash began strategizing a way to end the fighting once and for all. Abiding by Modoc military customs, the warrior's advisors believed if he and his men eliminated General Canby as the leader of the U.S. Army, they would simply leave and peace would be restored to the Modoc's ancestral lands. Kinpuash wasn't as enthusiastic about killing off General Canby and went the route of a federal peace commission offered by the U.S. government instead. This put him in lesser favor with some of the Modoc tribesmen, specifically the Warhawks, who had been increasing in numbers and influence during the months-long peace talks. Kinpuash wanted to be taken seriously and eventually agreed to the original plan targeting General Canby. On April 11th, 1873, Kinpuash and his inner circle of warriors attended the commission with pistols at the ready. When the signal was given by one of the advisors, Kinpuash and his men drew their weapons, with the subchief delivering the fatal blow to General Canby. He shot him twice in the head and proceeded to cut his throat, while three others in the commission were killed as well. After Kinpuash and the warriors fled back to the lava beds, the U.S. Army in Northern California added an extra 1,000 troops and flocked to the Modoc hideout with brute strength. They wasted no time attacking the stronghold, and instead of fighting back, most of the Modoc dispersed from the area to avoid imprisonment and certain death. In the following months, 
Kinpuash led several offenses against the United States military, but slowly his numbers dwindled and the efforts of the Modoc were in jeopardy of failing. Despite a number of tribesmen surrendering to the army in hopes of rekindling the small amount of cooperation that was left between settlers and Native Americans, Kinpuash remained free, doing everything he could to salvage his homeland. Sadly, Kinpuash's fortunes were crushed when a few of his Modoc warriors had enough of the conflict and turned in their military leader to the United States. Kinpuash, while betrayed by his men, still gave way to a ceremonial surrender, laying down his rifle and resorting to a peaceful arrest on June 1st. Later that summer, Kinpuash was tried for his crimes against the United States by a military court and was quickly found guilty on all counts. He was hanged on October 3rd of the same year, along with three other Modoc warriors, and the rest of the arrested council was sent to prison. For the remaining members of the Modoc tribe, they were once again forced to the Klamath Reservation, with some of them displaced all the way to reservations in present-day Oklahoma. Without a military leader to continue to defend their ancestral grounds, they were irreversibly wiped out from the place they had lived for generations. The fate of Kinpuash's remains then became the subject of much controversy, lasting until today. After the federal execution, the warrior's body was put on a train heading to Wairika, California, where it would be prepared for embalming to be used as a prop in a traveling carnival heading cross-country. Over time, these rumors were proven to be false, as the army had actually withheld the exact location of Kinpuash for years to keep his fate a secret. It wasn't until years later it was revealed the heads had been severed from the men who were hanged that October 3rd and sent to Washington, D.C. later that month for analysis by the Army Medical Museum. By 1898, the Smithsonian Institute in D.C. received the Modoc warrior skulls for their own research purposes, a fact that went unknown by the descendants of Kinpuash until the 1970s. It was then they made an official request to have the remains returned to the Klamath Reservation, and the Smithsonian abided by the appeal in the 1980s. These actions were themselves a part of a larger controversy, as many had felt Kinpuash deserved a proper ceremonial burial, as was custom for the Modoc culture. Having never received this, he was instead interred somewhere on the Klamath Reservation, and memorialized on the Fort Klamath site. To this day, the great warrior's descendants and other indigenous activists are hopeful that one day Kinpuash can return to his proper resting place near Tule Lake in Modoc County, California. After all, it's what the brave leader of his peoples deserved, as he dedicated and sacrificed his life in the name of legacy and the restoration of peace to the Modoc tribe.